Hey, welcome to the Citizen Mike Show. Thanks for tuning in. We do appreciate it. My name is Mike Burdinsky, and sharing that split screen with me is Wallingford's Chief of Police, John Ventura. Chief, thanks for coming on the Citizen Mike Show. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It's great that uh, you asked me to be a guest. Uh, looking forward to it. Yeah, I want to do that for a long time. But uh, we got a full agenda uh, today, so I want to get uh, right to it. Um, our viewers know that on October 29, an incident was reported to uh, the police department. A fire had engulfed a playscape at Doolittle Park. And um, after some investigation, it's my understanding that you apprehended uh, one or more uh, suspects. And then, you know, after that, I, I'm really lost track of what's happening. I was looking to you to bring us up to date. On, on the case? Sure, so the case uh, began in the patrol division. The initial investigation um, was transferred over to our detective unit. So the detectives actually, um, through their investigation, identified the individuals responsible for um, committing the arson. You know, we'll call it an arson at the playscape. And what they've done is they interviewed them and because they're juveniles, they sent juvenile arrest warrants down to New Haven Juvenile Court. Um, that's where they are right now, and we are waiting the juvenile prosecutor to review them and uh, send them back. Whether or not um, they sign them, then you know they'll get processed for the arrest. If not, you know, they'll give us some some guidance. But hopefully, you know, it goes the arrest route because that's what our, our um, goal is on that. Yeah, um, one of the possibilities with respect to punishment, as insofar as you know them. Well, I mean, as far as juvenile court goes, I mean, there's always the option for detention, but I think that's very unlikely. Uh, but what you do have is, you know, there are some programs out there. There is a uh, fire program that actually um, fire marshal, um, fire marshal's office in, in the town of Wallingford um, runs, which is an option for them. Um, restitution, obviously, is something that the town's looking forward to uh, as a penalty for, for the act. But you know, as far as what they can, they, they really have a, a far ranging options of what they can do uh, as far as punishment for the juvenile, just because it is a juvenile case separate from an adult case. If it was an adult case, you know, you know, kind of where the ballpark is for what the punishment would be. But for juveniles, you know, you really don't know until it happens. So our hope is that, you know, the message is sent and that there is punishment associated with these acts um, and the town yeah. proved its loss. Is there is there still a problem of, of, of young folks hanging around do little and sort of being rude, loud, obnoxious? I know that's not a crime, <laughs> but is there still an issue down there? And if so, of course, if there isn't now, it could pop up later. But I'm just wondering what the role of cameras are in this kind of a situation and, and what the status of the camera program is with respect to do little. Sure. So in the meantime, we have increased patrols in the area. Officers have been getting out, walking around uh, the park at all hours of the day. So we had a committee meeting a couple uh, days ago, which has some you know, stakeholders in the community to discuss some of the juvenile issues. And they've all acknowledged that you know, some of the issues that we have seen over the uh, summertime has dissipated a little bit, uh, which is good. Um, but as far as camera goes, you know, we really wanted to put the cameras in there, uh, you know, multiple, multiple reasons, right? Uh, cameras are multifaceted. One, it, it helps to protect the uh, property that we have. There's a lot of money invested in, in Doolittle Park and other, you know, areas of town, but, you know, especially in Doolittle, because it's it very vast, right? There's a lot of things that are in the park. You have the playscape, you have the softball field, the basketball field. So, you know, we wanted to come up with a system that can, you know, monitor that and, and give us an opportunity to intercede in some of the acts that might have been occurring. So that's what our camera system hopes to accomplish. It's a live feed that will come into the police department. Uh, plans are finalized. Uh, I know that uh, there might be an option for some ARPA money to pay for it. It's not going to be a chief endeavor. Um, so I think that ARPA might be appropriate for that. And that um, Park and Rec's director, Kenny Michaels, uh, finalized the bid. So as soon as we get um, authorization to put it out, that's what we're doing. But it, it's done. Um, and I think that it encompasses everything that we need and we're looking for for a security measure at the park. Yeah. Um, I want to pivot a little bit to the very, very broad topic of juvenile crime and you know what can be done. Uh, it's such a broad topic. We can't solve all the problems of the world in one episode of the Citizen Mike show. But I wanted to touch on a couple of narrow uh, issues um, and bring some information to the viewers. Um, I wanted to open up 
um, by reading a, a, a piece, part of a piece that I found in the New York Times, which sets some context. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and then I want to go over to uh, a, a recent juvenile crime bill that was passed to get your thoughts on that. Um, and then uh, based on our preparation for the show, you told me, uh, you whispered in my ear, there might be a juvenile review board uh, in Wallingford's future. So we want to cover that. Make some notes, make sure we cover them all. But I, um, I wanted to get to this piece um, that I found in, a, in the Sunday edition of the New York Times because I don't want to make a complicated issue appear simple. The issue of juvenile crime has got so many angles, so many layers of the onion um, that I wanted to add to this conversation some complexity because it's complex. So I, I'm really not asking you to um, react too much to what I'm saying. Uh, do if you want. I just feel I needed to get this out. That, that's really all I'm doing here. Um, but it talks about the national crisis that, that we're experiencing in our society today. And, and I think to the degree, to some degree, if there's a national social crisis, that's a petri dish for increased crime. Um, bear with me here. It says, we are now losing roughly 300 Americans a year to drugs, alcohol, and suicide in deaths of despair. The social fabric of innumerable communities, of innumerable families and countless communities has been unraveling, point two. About one in seven prime age men, ages 25 to 54, historically the pillar of the American labor force are not working today. We don't fully understand why, but it's not because jobs don't exist. There are 1.7 job openings for each unemployed worker. Third point, life expectancy for a newborn boy in Mississippi appears to be shorter than that for a newborn boy in Bangladesh. And finally, when so many adults are struggling, the problems are transmitted to the next generation, Hex, hence the nexus with juvenile crime. So uh, when so many adults are struggling, the problems are transmitted to the next generation. Every 19 minutes, a child is born with a dependence on opioids and one in eight American children is growing up with a parent with a substance use disorder. Sort of the backdrop for the juvenile crime problem across the country. Um, but I want to, uh, unless you have some thoughts on that, but I'll, I'll introduce sort of the next thread in our conversation, the crime bill. And I want to uh, read a little bit uh, to set the table factually from the Hartford Current. State legislature, this is from August, April 29, April 29, 2022 edition. State legislatures voted overwhelmingly on Thursday, April 28, for proposed changes in Connecticut's juvenile justice laws that are designed to target repeat criminals and reduce crime. The bill speeds up arraignments for juveniles, allows youths to be held for eight hours instead of the current six hours as a suspect's criminal history is being investigated, and allows GPS, global positioning system monitoring, for repeat criminals and while charges are still, are still pending among other provisions. Bear with me, I'm skipping around to make this shorter. The 22 page bill would allow longer prison sentences for serious crimes for young criminals, increasing the maximum from 60 up from 30 and allowing for a judge's discretion. Skipping ahead a lot, I'm skipping ahead. Um, with respect to that GPS, uh, if the offender is non-compliant with GPS monitoring, there is a path to detention, said uh, one of the state uh, uh, legislators that worked to uh, get this done. And finally, there is a, um, a representative, Patrick Callahan, a New Fairfield Republican, uh, who was the victim of two car thefts, said the bill would provide accountability and help prove that a youth was not involved in a car theft because the GPS would show exactly where he was. Quote, it's a great tool and alternative to incarceration and helps kids, said Callahan, a probation officer for nearly 30 years. This is a good amendment. It helps kids who have been in trouble once. It helps probation monitor them before it gets too bad. We can help the kids and help the victims of the crimes that have skyrocketed in recent years. I'm done reading. Chief, over to you. Your reaction to that bill or anything I said uh, um, how is how is the law working if it is? I mean, I think it was a, a good attempt, um, but it really didn't hit the areas that I think needed to 
be done to be effective in addressing the, the core issues, right? So, I mean, if someone does, it increases penalties for detention, but we have to get there first, right? So yesterday, prime example, we had multiple juveniles committing multiple robberies in town, um, engaging officers in pursuits, and then, you know, in three towns, right? So that ended up in a detention. But if we just had the stolen motor vehicle, chances are we're not going to end up in a detention situation. So therefore, we're, we're transferring the case and hoping that there's going to be a penalty associated on the, on the back side of that, which, you know, in law enforcement's um, experience, you know, I can only, you know, speak for some of the cases that we have, but I've heard from, you know, other chiefs is that there is really no mental penalty on the backside or nothing as severe as that something that we need or, or would make a difference in that. Um, so I think it's frustrating um, all around. I think that the legislators are doing, you know, what they can to kind of address some of the issues that we experience, but it's, it's not there yet. Um, you know, some of the programs that, you know, we've talked about that were effective, you know, the, the family with service needs, the youth in crisis, the youthful funded programs that aren't there, that the things that were there now, were taken away but not replaced. I mean, some of those things were important. Um, you know, you speak of the, the GPS system. I, I personally know, you know, individuals that we deal with in town that have monitors that have been all over the town, and it's it's not a, a live monitoring system as you would think. You know, if you don't cross an invisible geo fence, and all of a sudden the alarms go off, and all of a sudden we come, you know, barreling down. Hey, listen, you need to get back to your house. It doesn't work that way. Um, so yes, good try. I, I just think that maybe. We sit down there's there's more that we can do is there a consensus in the police community um or you personally do you have any thoughts on what more could be done uh, is there any specifics um or is it i really think it starts in the household i mean a lot of you know the, the juveniles unfortunately that we deal with have a very tough home life right they have a one come from a one parent house so there's a lot of things going on the parents working there's not a lot of you know oversight or supervision, so that's why you see them out, you know, around town or doing things because there's really no one at home to enforce anything. So you know the family with service needs application, that, you know, that was you know prior like maybe almost a decade ago, gave the parents you know an avenue where they can apply to the you know a formal to the judicial process to try to help them right to to have a, a probation officer oversee their child where the house rules needed to be followed you know so, you know, kids needed to go to school. Uh, and all that was could be reported to the probation officer. And there were consequences to not following those rules. Um, but that was never really replaced. And now parents that we're dealing with, myself and, you know, uh, Amanda Moran up at Youth and Social Services, you know, we're dealing with some of these parents that just feel so helpless because there's really nothing they can do. And they're saying, I can't control my child. I need help. And, you know, the resources are not there to kind of help them. And that's, you know, it hurts us. Um, we see what they're going through and it also hurts the child because the child's acting out now there's not much you know for them to do there's not many services that we can get them so you know in town that's why we, we talked about doing this juvenile review board to kind of help everybody a little bit okay let's get to that um juvenile review board may be in wallingford's future um as we discussed uh, in preparing for the show start from the beginning though um what is a juvenile reboard a review board what can it do? What can it not do? Uh, and who might make it up? And when might we see it? So right now we have what's called a diversion program. So any you know low level misdemeanor offenses or non judicial cases, we the officer will intercede, investigate, and then refer uh, the case through use and social services for follow up uh, with Amanda Miranda and her staff. Um, based on the volume and kind of the complexities of what we've been seeing, especially over the summer. You know, we sat down um, and said we need something a little more formal, right? So we needed a process that was more formal. And the Juvenile Review Board is something that's been in, in, in effect for a while now in, in different communities. And we looked at the model that Meriden was doing and a couple other um, jurisdictions. And we said it's something that we would like to try to implement in Wallingford. So basically what would happen is an officer would go to a juvenile um complaint and if the, the officer deemed it to be something that we don't think is judicial not you know non-criminal or something that's low level at the court normally would not accept the officer would issue the juvenile a hearing summons which would require the, uh, the parent or the guardian of the juvenile to contact the hearing board officer to schedule a hearing or an intake in which it's more of a formal process so the parent or guardian would come in 
sit before the board as would the child separately and then collectively together. And then the board itself can come up with some sort of, of path for the juvenile, whether it be mental or health, you know, social services, whether it be, you know, drug treatment, um, community service uh, in town, it's something that we can, you know, look at and, and something that we would, you know, like, you know, to consequence the action, um, showing that there is something that, that can be done to you. It's not the, you know, you can't do anything to us adage that we're hearing. And the board would consist of, you know, the police department, the fire department, youth and social services, department of children and families, um, New Haven judicial, uh, juvenile judicial, and then maybe, you know, a civic group from town where, you know, you have that kind of partnership from town. And then the juvenile and the parent would be required to follow through on the requirements of what the board came up with. And if they don't, then it could come back to the police department for a potential criminal referral. Um, and it kind of gives teeth to the whole process instead of just saying, you know, we're going to go to the, the diversion program. And then, you know, if you follow through, then maybe, you know, we don't have to deal with you anymore. But this kind of gives, you know, some teeth to our town. It gives, gives a little buy-in to everyone. When might we see this if everything goes smoothly and according to plan? I would hopefully uh, like to see it within the first couple of months of uh, the new year. I mean, 2023, we'd like to get that established. So as we get into the warmer months and uh, we start seeing, you know, an uptick in what we're going to, you know, what we yeah. can see, that it's something's in place that uh, we don't have to, you know, all of a sudden now rush. Let's, let's get it in place. Let's get it formulated and in the process. So when we do start seeing a lot of cases come in, we're ready for them. Uh, give me an overview of what has been the report from other towns. Um, nothing is perfect. I get that. Um, but obviously they're encouraging you or you're getting encouragement from what you see around the state. Is that, is that right? If you take, for example, like Meriden, um, you know, there's just what it, what it allows you to do is have more resources, right? So right now, the, the only resource that we would have off of a diversion program is YSS staff and potentially some, you know, what they can do with that. You know, when you bring in all these different groups together, you know, there's so many more things that, you know, different perspectives that we can look at. And, you know, even, you know, take, for example, the arson or, or what if we had a, a minor incident with a juvenile that, that started a fire? Well, we have the fire department now on this board, which can, you know, there's multiple programs that they have, which can, you know, intervene with this meal because it's more than, you know, the action, you know, you have to get the root cause of why we're causing the action. And I think that, in order to change the behavior, we have to address that first and to have all the professionals together uh, with different perspectives, different resources from their um, departments, it'll help us get to that point. Yeah, so I mean, I mean this, this sounds great, um, yet the um, Police Review Board has probably been on the books for many years. I, I don't know when it got first enacted. Um, why now? Is there something that triggered it or it just, takes longer to do things in Wallingford. <laughs> I think, well, I mean, when, when Amanda Miranda was originally doing the diversion um, program, it was, she worked in the agency, right? So she was part of the police department and we kind of triaged the cases through there. So his officer just went down the hallway, brought it to her, and then, you know, she would take care of it. Um, when she moved to YSS, now it's, you know, a paper process to refer. But I think that in looking at, you know, the cases, we're getting a lot of volume of cases. We're getting, you know, the same juveniles over and over again. And I think that having a more formal process, now the one thing I can say, and I've said it before, is that in dealing with some of the juveniles in the past, there was always a respect, right? There was always respect for the, for the office, you know, the law enforcement uh, uniform and for the, for the department. And we've kind of lost that a little bit. And the diversion program, as great as it was, I think that it's not as formal as what needs to be. I think a, a formal process brings back that respect level that we've lost. You know, to sit in front of a board as, as a 14-year-old kid uh, full of professionals that are asking you questions and, and going to require you to answer them, I think that adds a little more, you know, gravity to the situation other than what we do now. And that's what we're looking for. I mean, this is, you know, Businesses are being affected by by these juveniles' actions, right? And there needs to be a consequence, and they need to feel that. And if the court system's not going to do it, we as a community need to come together and come up with the best way to to approach this. And I think that this review board gives us that. Let's change the subject for a little bit, and and I want to get uh, an overview from you as the status of criminal activity in Wallingford, you know what the trends are, that that kind of a thing. But before I turn it over to you. Um, 
I, I pulled off a, a report issued uh, by the state of Connecticut about crime statistics uh, statewide for whatever they're worth. Um, certainly, if you've been a victim of a crime, no statistic is going to give you any sort of comfort. Um, but um, it's 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 useful information to have in the back of your head. So this study um, a statewide covered 10 years from 2012 to 2021. And what I did is I took the first three years of that study, 2012, 13, and 14, and I averaged all the arrests statewide in that three-year grouping. And I compared it to the uh, number of arrests in the last three years, that'd be 2019, 20, and 21. And here's what I have found based only on that simple analysis, that the, uh, the, the average of uh, all arrests in the first three years is 114,360. And in the last three years, it dropped down to 77,787. So I'm not cherry picking any particular one year. And the reason why I took this 10 year period is because that's what was on the internet. That's what was in the report. That's what I had to work with. Um, as far, as far as juvenile arrest, because it breaks it down uh, under 18 and over 18, uh, in the first three years of the uh, study, 2012, 13, and 2014, the average number of juvenile arrests, juvenile arrests uh, was 10,531, but in the last three years, it was down to 4,801. Now, What's happening in Wallingford? What do you what do you, what are the numbers there? So I think in Wallingford, you know, we're big, right? I think that people don't realize how busy a town we are. You know, I think that when you think of Wallingford, you think of small town, you know, America, and it's it's quiet. But you know, we're big. You know, we're we're busy as far as the police department goes. I mean, we're a busy police department, and you know, we deal with a lot of incidents throughout the day. Um, the commercial business on Route Five alone, you know, the Business is great, right? It's great for the tax base. It's great for the public and the ease and convenience of going and doing things, but it also increases the amount of call value for the police department, right? So when you look at you know, a simple statistic like shoplifting, right? At this point in the year compared to last year, we're up you know, 23%. So we've investigated formally. Like, so this is, you know, there are unreported shoplifting that we'll get, but there's 223 shoplifting incidents that we've investigated so far to this date, right? So that's, that's up. Um, and we, you know, typically we'll take, a, a, you know, five or six, you know, a day, you know, multiple places, you know, Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, you know, mostly Walmart or shop, right? Um, theft of motor vehicles, we're up, right? So we're all up almost 83%. So last year we had 47 stolen motor vehicles. This year we're at 86. Um, commercial burglars actually are down, but I think it's because we have a rise in catalytic converter thefts, right? Or, or shoplifting. It's like kind of the the trend, but overall, we're at about the same number as we are last year as far as total incidents. Um, what we're seeing, though, is there is an increase in, in that that shoplifting. Um, and what we saw yesterday, you know, we're not immune to, to violent crime. Like purse snatchings is a, is a very personal violent crime, and unfortunately, it happened to our, you know our our community. But you know, it's because of that that's attractive for criminals because you have a a, a lot of business, a lot of commercial business congregated in a very small area, which lends them to be able to go from Walmart to ShopRite to Cumberland Farms really quickly and, and commit a lot of crimes and then get out of there. So based on uh, what you're seeing, not, not necessarily on the statistics, but based on what you're seeing, because you're downtown and that's going to change and I'm unhappy about that. But uh, based on what you're seeing, is it safe to walk in downtown Wallingford at night? Is it safe to walk on the other side of the uh, gazebo and, and the Old Brothers parking lot at night? Uh, and I guess I'm addressing street crime, you know, muggings, robberies, um, things like that. Um, your view. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you really look at our, our core incidents of, you know, of robberies and things like that, it's, it's concentrated in the commercial areas, like Walmart parking lot, um, something similar to that. I mean, very okay. rarely do we see what, you know, what you said, that like an individual walking, just casually walking down the street and then someone coming up and robbing them. Um, we're lucky in that respect, right? But we do see those incidents occurring you know, more so in those commercial areas, uh, okay. just because of you know, it's easy to sneak a stolen car into you know a parking lot full of a thousand cars, blend in, and then commit your your act and get out of there very fast. You know, it's crime of opportunity, but 
Um, I would say that we are as a community lucky that we don't have that on street crime as some other communities do. So I, I would have no hesitation in walking around Wallingford, but you know, ultimately you need to just be cognizant of your surroundings always. So I, I wanna change the subject on it. And um, the ultimate question it, for you is gonna be after I give you some introductory stuff, which I always do, because uh, you've been on the show for half an hour or whatever it is. Um, but the ultimate question I'm gonna ask you is, uh, do we have enough in the way of police resources? That's where I'm going to go after we get through that. And then is, you know, how do we define enough in the way of police officers uh, sworn in and civilian? But bear with me. Uh, these are uh, more statistics that I uh, pulled off um, this study issued by the state. And it has to do with the employee, police department employee rate per 1,000 people of population that you nodded your head as if you're familiar with this chart. Um, the average for all of Connecticut is 2.51 employees, you know, police department employees per thousand in population. Keep that in mind, 2.51. Uh, Wallingford is 1.98 below the average. I'm not making a statistical argument, but it is, you know, information that is sort of useful in assessing you know, your staffing. Um, Windsor, pretty close to Wallingford, 1.99. Southington is 2.00. And I just picked out North Haven because it's close, 2.51. Um, when I was on the council, once in a while, a statistical argument was made and I, interesting, but that doesn't necessarily tell us the conditions on the ground. Uh, it, it really, maybe, you know, 1.98 1. 1. is enough. Uh, maybe you can do your job and, and provide adequate service with that 1.99, maybe not. That's my question to you. I mean, I would always love more officers, right? So I think if you do the number, we should be around anywhere from 85 to 90 officers. We're busy enough to do that having more officers allows you to do more things, right? So you can be reactive and proactive at the same time if you have enough cars on the road. So right now, if we have six cars on the road, a lot of those guys are hesitant to maybe do motor vehicle enforcement because they know that there's going to be something in their zone at Walmart. Or there's going to be a domestic that they have to respond to that you know requires multiple, multiple officers to respond to. If you can run more cars a shift, you can do more, right? Um, I would love, in a perfect world, I would love to have 10 units on each shift come out uh, of the parking lot and, and cover the town. Um, that would be ideal. So I'm going to be a little playful with you. Don't take this too uh, too seriously or personally. You know, you have more more cruisers and more police cars on patrol. You're just going to have more speed traps, and then I'm going to get tickets, and, I, you know, it's you're become a revenue agent. So um, so my, my question, I guess, more specifically, are there emergencies that you just can't get to or crimes that happen and you arrive too late on the scene and maybe witnesses disappear or someone escapes are those kinds of examples happening with more frequency no i mean our our cars respond quickly um i think that what we would want is that instead of getting that two or three car response you're getting maybe because of qualifying you're getting a one car response initially and then you're getting re additional resources you know, coming afterwards uh as an administrator, as a chief, you always want you know your officers to be safe, right? So more officers being able to look around and see things is safer, especially you know when you look at 2022, it's it's going to end up being one of the most deadly uh, law enforcement years as far as deaths go, um, almost of all time, right? And, and a lot of that is gunfire and ambushes. So you know, the more officers there, the more safe for everyone involved. But right now we do respond. We're we're not deficient in response to any uh, call, but what you might get is initially one officer and not multiple officers because they're on something else and need to clear and, and then they'll end up there. Um, so in yeah. a perfect world, I would like, you know, every call to have two to three officers being able to show up and then assess and triage and maybe not need them originally, but have that available at all times. And to do so, that's, that's more staffing, you know, in those units. So, again, this got by me. Um, how many um, uniformed officers are there on duty now at any at any one time? So if you work, I mean, our, our numbers haven't changed in a while. So our midnight shift, the minimum amount of patrol units on midnights is four, right? So 
It's four plus uh, one supervisor on the desk during the weekdays. Uh, for the day shift, that's six officers on the road and one, off, one person on the desk during the day shift. And for nights, that's another six officers on the road and one officer uh, on the desk during the day. Um, so what's the total then, the total uniform um, staff? So uniform staff, I think we have almost, actually I had the numbers, almost 38, right? So 38 patrol, patrol officers. Um, that's not including detectives or community impact or traffic, but the, the core group, the backbone of the agency that responds to everything right off the bat is patrol division, and we're about 36 to 38 officers. Now, and, and the total aggregate, include the detectives, include, you know, everyone who's a, a sworn police officer. What's the total there? So I think we're at 70 right now. We have uh, four seats in the um, April Academy, which we today have gotten the list to start filling. So uh, we're going to start conducting interviews on that to put, you know, four more people in the Academy. I'm going to um, an Academy graduation tomorrow in um, Milford for two of our officers that are come on the road. Uh, so we're, we're hiring as fast as possible. Um, so right, we're going to that. We're gonna get to that in a minute, uh, uh, recruitment. Have you ever had more than 70 or 71 uh, on board at any one time? Um, it depends. Like, we, you know, you have, you, you get to what you think is almost full, then you have someone retire or you have someone, you know, get hurt. So in, in a perfect world, you always would love to run at max staffing. It just never happens. What is max staffing? Right now, for us, we're uh, allotted for 78 officers. 78, did you say? Perfect. Yeah. 78. So this issue of um, staffing, for me, morphs into the issue of recruitment. Um, I read, and I, I'll get to, I'll fill that blank in in a minute. I, I, it's somewhat confusing, but I, I read this report from the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And it's a paper on a crisis for law enforcement, the state of recruitment. And across the country, uh, the police departments are having one heck of a time recruiting new officers and keeping them. There are a couple of reasons that they discuss um, for this. And I want to I, I want to get to that. Um, I think I want to get to that right now. What are some of the what are some of the reasons why police departments are having trouble recruiting? The first one they talk about is generational differences. The second one is the public image of law enforcement. And the third is hiring process challenges. In a minute, I'm going to turn it over to you and say, are you experiencing you know, this, that, and the other? But let me set the table for a minute. Generational differences, uh, millennials and Generation Z, loosely defined as individuals who range from high school age to the late 30s are more apt to value work-life balance than their baby boomer counterparts. This translates into young people hoping for more flexible hours and guaranteed time off. Mandated overtime and missing holidays with family are less appealing to millennials and members of Generation Z. I'm skipping a bit. For younger people, leaving a job after a few years is commonplace and moving from job to job is often how the younger generation uh, workers move up the ladder in their careers. So that's generally speaking, let's go over to you and to Wallingford. And if you would love, let's say, to be able to off, uh, offer to uh, your police officers sort of a flexible schedule, more time off, the quality of life kind of a schedule, it seems to me you can't do that unless you have more police officers, but discuss that with me. What's your thought? We're not immune to, we experience the same recruitment issues. Um, you know, I, I, I can think back to when I took the test, right? September of, you know, 2001, 2002, uh, there was, you know, 3,000 people in the gym in Brantford that were uh, there for the physical uh, test, right? Now we're, we're, I'm working off a list right now of 17. And of the 17, I can't guarantee that I'll get a handful that you know, is, is suitable uh, to be a police officer. So it's tough. It really is tough. And, and like you said, it's people are not going into law enforcement um, for a variety of reasons. I think you know, the narrative on law enforcement over the past couple of years has not been positive. I think that you know, the, the police, law enforcement in general needs to do a better message. You know, it needs to have a better message and uh, 
to some of the younger you know, people in this country about what law enforcement is and, and what the profession entails. You know, a lot of people in college that were in criminal justice uh, that would go into law enforcement now we're going into you know different fields. You know, not specifically related to you know police work. So, you know, we need a better narrative. But on top of that, you know, you're right, and that and that study is right. Is that what you're finding is that people that that we are hiring now they they don't want to work swing shifts, right? They don't want to work nights. They don't want to work weekends. They don't want to work overtime. They want to put their eight hours in, hopefully Monday through Friday, eight to four, and then go home. Um, you know, if there's an overtime opportunity, a lot of them are not taking it. Uh, what you would see, for, you know, historically in the past is that you would have an event like Celebrate Wallingford where you, you had so many people that you, you couldn't, you know, fill it with. You know, we'd have 30, 40 people for 10 jobs. Now, you know, you're almost having to order people in because they don't want to work on Sunday. So, you know, there is a shift. And, you know, when you sit down and talk to people in their, you know, initial chief's interview for, you know, initial appointment for entry level, you know, first thing out of someone's mouth is, you know, when can I be a detective? I want to be a detective, you know, I want to, you know, what's your schedule like? And, you know, our schedule before, and I don't think people realize that our schedule, when I got hired, you know, you would work 30 days on days, and then you would rotate, and you would work 30 days on four to 12s, and then you would rotate and work 30 days on midnights, and you would keep doing that. Every 30 days, you would rotate. Uh, our union got together and came up with a better schedule, which you work, you know, would work four day, days on, two days off. But the way that you do that makes you work a five days on, one day off, five days on, one day off, five days on, one day off, which is very taxing, especially for a midnight officer. So um, we definitely need a, a, another schedule. The union's working on it. But in order to do some of the scheduling that you know maybe a four four day on 10 hour shift you need more people um because how many, how many more i mean for us i think that we would have to really get above the 80 mark to do 10 hour days um i could be wrong i mean i would have to sit down and see the numbers and work with the you know hr and the union president to kind of see where we stand with that but you know it is my experience that in in agencies that do do a you know a basically a four two schedule with 10 hour days, it requires more staffing because of the time off. Sure. So when I'm, when I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it from the perspective of government, you know, the taxpayer, the council, the mayor, the people that have to pay for it. But at the same time, I'm saying, well, wait a minute, Wallingford, if you want to attract the best candidates, and we do, and you want to retain them so they don't move on, um, you've learned sort of, that it's not all about money, it's about quality of life. And in order to have that sustainable police department that sticks around Wallingford, knows Wallingford, and will high morale because the work schedule is something that matches their lifestyle, you gotta pay for it. Right. Um, and I say, well, that's not so bad. Are you gonna bring this up during budget time? We're bringing it up here. Cause I think, you know, I think I would love to have Wallingford like the, first town in the state to offer a four day work week or one of the three. And so the, the people that might've worked in Bridgeport or Hartford or Greenwich say, wait a minute, let, let's take a look at Wallingford. They got some other towns don't have. Yeah, I mean, and the union president has is, is been great. He's been, you know, the union president for you know, almost, I think 15 or you know, plus years. And I actually, before I became the chief and became an administrator, I was the union vice president for over a decade. So. You know, I know in my head where we need to get to. And, you know, I work well with, you know, Sergeant Cofaso, who's the union president. And, you know, we need to sit down and come up with some ideas, you know, some cost, some non cost that makes us attractive. Because the reality is, in the past, you would take the first agency that offered you a job. You didn't care where it was. You didn't care, you know, how long you had to drive or what, you know, if they called you up and said, I want to offer you a job, you said, yes, I'm taking that job. Now, the experience is, okay, you're offering me a job, but I have an offer from, you know, Department A, Department B, Department C, Department D, what I'm going to do is I'm going to weigh all the benefits and then I'll get back to you and I'll let you know whether or not I want to come to you. So you know, that's what we're up against. So we need to be as attractive as possible in the higher, you know, and what we have in our, our benefits package. So when we go out into the hiring field, you know, we are attractive, you know, we're getting people, um, but ultimately it's going to get to the point where I don't want an officer to leave here because another agency has better benefits or, or, um, more fringe benefits, let us say, or, or you have an entry level officer that's like, you know what, I'm going to pass on Wallingford because, you know, Department C has, you know, more comp time or, or has a better schedule. 
So, you know, thank you, Wally, for, for the opportunity, but I'm going to go here. Uh, I want to move on down the list um, and, and keep an eye on the clock at the same time. But one of the challenges to recruitment is uh, the public image of law enforcement. Um, reading a, a little bit uh, uh, from this piece, it says many young people view police differently than their parents may have. Overall, the majority of police officers feel their jobs have gotten more difficult since high profile use of force incidents have dominated the national conversation. Line of duty deaths have also become more highly publicized, including the killings of police due to community tension such as the mass shooting in Dallas uh, of Dallas police officers in 2016. Each of these factors contribute to the negative perception of policing as a career opportunity for potential recruits. I don't think there's too much you can do about that unless you think there is. I mean, I, it is what it is. I, yeah, just, I think that in a social media age, you know, you know, we talked about generations, right? Generations in the past didn't have access to social media. If an incident happened, you know, what they knew about the incident was reported on the news or maybe in the newspaper. But, you know, the current generation, they have access to Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and TikTok. And you see these different videos and the replays of the videos and you have more access to a lot more things. Like I can sit on my phone and see, you know, an incident that happened in California with a police officer, or, you know, Arizona or Connecticut or Maine. You know, it's at your fingertips. And, you know, when you constantly see some of those negative things that are online, I mean, it kind of you know shapes your perception of, of what law enforcement is. So that's why I said law enforcement needs to kind of change the narrative. Like you see law enforcement do certain things like the lip sync challenge or, or certain things to kind of you know improve our image, but it needs to be consistent. Um, and it needs to be consistent in everyday interactions. Like you can't have a campaign where you're nice and you're, you know, you're singing and dancing and everything's happy, but then you go on the road and have an interaction and, and it's negative interaction, right? The officers need to realize that that one interaction that they have with you know a member of the public, if it's negative, it's it's going to have ramifications for the entire agency. So you know it's it needs to you know in the social media age, you need to make sure that you're professional and courteous when you're you know dealing with the public because that that shapes their opinions of us. Um, the last one, um, and I'll just ask for a quick response because we I got to keep again keep an eye on the clock. Says uh, the recruiting process can be long and arduous. Of the respondents to this survey, 47.5% reported having a hiring process that lasts anywhere from four months to over a year. So if you're, if you're looking for a job, I mean, this is kind of tough. Maybe you're supporting a young family. I don't know. Take it, take it from there. What's, what's the... Yeah, I mean, the process is long and arduous. Uh, it, if you look at it, right, so you... You want to be a police officer, you, you either take a, you know, something through a police app or South Central Criminal Justice Association, do your application, and then they're going to call you and set it up for a written test. You pass the written test, you go to the oral test, you pass the oral test, then you go and the, the individual departments get your application, and then you do a chief's interview, a polygraph, a medical, a psychological, uh, another um exit, you know, physical agility test. Then you go to the academy for 20, you know, 26 weeks. That's when you get out of the academy, you go to FTO for multiple months, then finally you're on your own. So if I have a vacancy and I look to fill it, I use an entry level person, I'm looking at almost a year. And that's why you kind of see a lot of agencies going the certified route, uh, which creates a whole other issue between the agencies, because now I'm going to poach an uh, officer from your agency to come to my agency. I'm going to leave you short. Um, and there's a little animosity there between you know the agencies. So it's a very fine line. I think the recruitment is, is in the length of it is kind of pushing a lot of departments to fill their vacancies as quickly as possible with certifies from other other departments. And, you know, it gets, you know, when you see another chief from another agency and you just took their officer, it gets a little uncomfortable. Okay. A new, a new, a new uh, concept of theft. Yeah. Um, let's change the subject. Um, how about a police station update? Uh, what have you learned? Uh, are you looking forward? You know, what's sort of the, some of the uh, strong points of the new facility? Describe the new facility briefly. What are some of the weak spots? So I, I love this building, right? So I, I love this. This is all I have known for 20 years. I, I like the castle, right? We, we do. Um, the building uh, you're in. North, north. Early in. Now, we, you know, I, I like the armory. Um, but you realize that we've, we've reached our limitations as far as space goes. Um, 
there's a lot a lot of things that we want to do that we just can't accomplish in the building. You know, we want to uh, stand up a pro professional standards unit um, to handle accreditation, a lot of internal affairs things that we have. Like we're makeshifting an office right now for those individuals because we don't have any room. Um, we would love to expand and, and give the detectives uh, you know, some rooms to do some, you know, we have people in, in task force for commu computer crimes, but we have really no room to put them in there, you know, when they need to do their things. We have a, a collect room that doubles as, you know, an office that doubles as, you know, a union office. There's, there's so, we, we need the room. The new building on Barnes Road uh, gives us that opportunity. But in doing so, I know it takes us away from the center of town. Um, we're not going, you know, we're not going anywhere. You know, we will be around, but I think that when you kind of look at where we are and, you know, going back to, you know, what we're talking about with commercial industry, we're, we're around that 68 Route 5 corridor a lot more than we are down Center Street in, in Orchard and Whittlesea. Um, like we probably were previous, uh, but with the expansion of a lot of the businesses, we are experiencing more volume, you know, as we go towards that 68 corridor. Um, what about a move-in date? Has one been projected? I mean, to be honest with you, I've heard a lot of different dates. I think that the latest date is somewhere around summer of 2024. Um, that's what I think our, our latest estimate was, summer of 2024, like August, you know, July, August of that. Um, the bids went out yesterday uh, for different portions of it. I didn't have a chance to speak to uh, Allison Kapuscinski about some of the bids, but um, that was yesterday. We met with the interior uh, designer uh actually yesterday also to kind of go over some of the uh things that we need for the you know offices in the building for the lobby and you know different parts of the building so we're, we're moving forward with it uh it's a matter of you know i think the the rough estimates are maybe beginning construction or demolition and construction somewhere in february 2023 um but then again you know it's all dependent on materials and, and labor and sure. sure um let's change the subject there's something in Connecticut called a, a red flag law. Mm -hmm. um, would you walk us through what that is, what it's intended to accomplish in your experience with it? So it's intended to, you know, get, if, if an individual, if the person is an imminent threat to themselves or others, it gives the law enforcement community an opportunity to remove any firearms that that person may have or prevent that individual from purchasing firearms. So if I have, Register firearms to me and the officers deem that person to be an immediate threat to themselves or others. It allows the officer to file what is called a risk uh, risk order, uh, goes before a prosecutor, then a judge, and then the officer can then enter. It's two officers um, need to be uh, co affiants on this on this application, and they can go into a residence or a vehicle, remove the firearms um, from that individual because of the harm that they you know pose or if the person does not have a firearm uh, or firearms permit, it prevents that individual from getting, you know, such permit or, or firearm by doing the risk warrant for them. Um, so let me, give, let, me give, let me give you an example. Um, you get a call from a frantic woman who says, help, help, my 22-year-old son is threatening to shoot his unfaithful girlfriend and then shoot himself. And he's here in the kitchen loading his gun. I don't know if the red flag law applies, but how do you deal with that situation? So there's multiple things that we could do with that. I mean, that's, there's a, there's a criminal element to it, right? There's a threat, there's a you know, threat with a firearm. There's a mental health uh, component to that. So the more than likely the individual probably would be arrested. Um, for whatever applicable statutes that they violated. And then, you know, they probably under a, a emergency committal would go to the hospital because they're threatening to harm themselves and others. Then the officer at that point would, you know, complete a risk warrant, go into the residence and secure those firearms that the person had, remove them from the house, bring them to the police department. And then if the individual wants those, those firearms back, they would be required to go before a judge in a hearing and present arguments as to why they would get those fire, they need those firearms back. And the officers would also present their evidence as to why they should not have those firearms back. So let me change the example, make it a little less urgent. Yep. Let's suppose you get a call from a woman that said, last week, my 22 year old son threatened to shoot his unfaithful girlfriend 
and I'm worried he may do harm to himself. So there's no imminent danger to it, but that's the scenario. How would you deal with that? I mean, there's a lot of things that you could do. And I, I mean, if you can develop the probable cause to show that there is there is an imminent threat, if you can do some interviews, speak to the family and actually say, you know what, this this is a threat, we can do the, the risk warrant. Um, but I mean, an, an officer, if they think that there is a threat and it's not imminent, we could do a search warrant to go and, and secure that firearm, you know, if there is you know, some sort of criminal element to it. So there's, there's different avenues to that. Um, We've always had the option to do this kind of risk war. This is not something that's new to, to law enforcement. We, we've done these in the past, but with the, you know, the change in the legislature and some of the wording to it, I think that we're doing it more because now we're applying it to people that we commit. You know, are they an imminent threat to themselves or, or, or others based on their mental capacity? So um, it's kind of increased the amount of risk wars that we have done. Um, but it's not anything that's new to law enforcement per se. We've already always had these opportunities to do so. They, you know, they just had it under different, you know, under different names. How common is the scenarios that I laid out in Wallingford? We have, I mean, we deal with mental health issues every day. Um, so it's very common. Um, not, not maybe the, the firearms, you know, the first, you know, instance with the, the girlfriend and the firearm there, but we, you know, deal with people that, you know, threaten to harm themselves or others, maybe they have firearms in the house, but haven't brandished them or, you know, you know, shown them or threatened them, but the threat still exists. Um, so our detective division are the ones that will take over those cases, file the applications and, and do the follow-ups. Um, so do these kind of cases, um, maybe they're suicidal, maybe they're not, maybe they're homicidal, you know, they, as I described, does that take special training on behalf of the detectives to get the job done without aggravating the situation or can anyone do it? I think that anyone can do it. I mean, our detective division has specialized training. I mean, our detective lieutenant is the crisis negotiator um, commander. So he has specialized training in, in crisis negotiation as do a lot of our detectives, our emergency response team members. So they do have some added, I would say, um, attributes that allow them to handle it a little bit better than the patrol. And they actually have more time to do it. You know, patrol is a little rushed. Detectives have the time to do it. They have the, the expertise in how to construct the, you know, the affidavit. And then ultimately it's up to the judge. The judge can find that the person is not an imminent threat and refuse the, the order. But um, as far as the wallet for police department goes, you know, we need to make sure that we're doing what we can. You know, we have no control over what happens once it goes up to court, but it allows us to intercede hopefully in a, an event that might be catastrophic if we weren't there. Yeah. Hey, um, let's make that the final word. We've uh, we've run out of time. Thanks for coming on the Citizen Mike Show. We do appreciate it. Our viewers, thank you too. And um, you know, good luck with your recruitment. I hope that works out. I'm personally supportive of more police officers and get more flexible schedules so we can have a you know a stable staff and a happy staff. And I wouldn't mind paying a little bit more for it. So there you go. Um, so again, a final thanks, and hopefully you see you again on the uh, Citizen Mike Show. And thank you, viewers, for uh, tuning in. Citizen Mike Show is uh, posted up on WPAA TV weeknights at 9 p.m. Check out WPAA TV. So long, John. Chief. Thanks very much. We appreciate it. All right. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.